Today we're in our series, Evidence. Uh, we talked about love last week, and we're talking about the evidences of Christ working in our life. If you're a Christian, there should be evidence. There should be fruit. There should be something presenting the love and the power of Christ in our life in, in some measure, okay? So we're gonna look at Galatians 5.22, and it says, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, I love the simple fact that the Holy Spirit produces it. We don't have to be actors. We don't have to turn it on, turn it off. We don't have to manufacture these things. But when we're surrendering our heart to Jesus Christ, he produces this in us at some measure. The goal is, is the longer that we are a Christian, the more fruit we should be producing. That was way too quiet. That was not something they had to think about. Let's try it again. Are you ready? Balcony? When you're a Christian, you should be producing some kind of evidence. Amen? The longer you're a Christian, you should be producing more evidence. Okay, all right, now we're getting somewhere. Today we're gonna be talking about joy. Joy, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now, joy, so many, so many people think that joy um, has the evidence of laughter. So if you have joy, you must be happy. No, I mean, I've seen drunk people happy for a little bit. Just because somebody laughs doesn't mean that that's the joy of the Lord. Come on, come on, there, there's comedy clubs and people are laughing at things that are inappropriate and, and sick and disgusting and they laugh at that. That is not the joy of the Lord. So just because somebody's laughing, that doesn't mean that it comes from God. But joy is a strength. It's a fortitude that is found on the inside of us. And so when I say the joy of the Lord is our strength, I want to define it as this. When you're walking with the joy of the Lord, it's literally having the expectation of God's outcome in your life. Bad stuff, difficult things, I don't care what you're facing, at the end of the day, you're still walking forward because you expect God's outcome in your life. Not the devil's, not the world's, not the doctor's report, not the divorce papers. You expect God's outcome in your life. That is a strength and a fortitude that can only come from God. Now, I want to talk about the simple fact is joy is a result of what you focus on. If you focus on the word of God, that is the promises of God, which are yes and amen, then you'll know what you can expect for your life. Look, we are getting as bad as the Catholics were 20, 30, 40 years ago as far as not even knowing our own Bible. We, we Protestants, we used to tease the Catholics about no, not knowing their Bible. But now we're just as bad as, as a Christian uh, society here in America that we don't even know what God's promises say about us. We, we talk to people and we say, have you, have you read the healing scriptures? What do you mean the healing scriptures? Do you know there's hundreds of healing scriptures in the word of God, promises for your health, promises for your mind, promises for your body? Promises, yeah, but if you don't know it, the Bible says people perish for the lack of knowledge. So you need to know the word of God so you can focus on the word of God so you know what your outcome is. Look, whatever you focus on will either bless you or curse you. Whatever you focus on will either build you up or tear you down. It will either, either encourage you or discourage you. When, when you hear the word encourage, discourage, you know what the root word is there? Courage. The ability to do things that other people can't do. Whatever you focus on, it will either empower you or it will defeat you. I want to talk about a broke down people. People that lost their joy. They had no hope. They've, they've, they've become institutionalized in their misery. And so we're going to go into the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king. He was, you know, a lot of people think, wow, it must be cool to be the cupbearer to the king, man. You're the closest person to the king. Really? No, all the cupbearer is is you are the first person in line to be the least important. 
because you were the food taster. If somebody tried to poison the king, you had to taste it first. So if you died, then they didn't eat the food and they would replace you. So to be the cupbearer was a non-essential but essential place. But Nehemiah had the heart and, and the ear of the king, and he was talking about Jerusalem, and he, he heard a bad report. And I want to explain Jerusalem. Let's put up this, this graphic here. The walls of Jerusalem was about 2.5 miles in circumference, 40 feet tall, 8 feet wide or thick, had 34 watchtowers and 12 gates. It was a fortified city. But the report that Nehemiah got was that the city had been in ruins. It was torn down. It was destroyed. And it was destroyed a long time ago. But, you know, that's how fast news traveled back then. It's not like today, right? See, Jerusalem was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar in 582 B.C. And so the city laid in ruins over 100 years. It had no walls, no gates, which meant that the raiders could come and steal. They could pillage. Anybody see The Three Amigos, the movie Three Amigos? We are the three. Great movie. But if you remember what happened is the raiders, the bandits or the banditos, they would come in and raid the village. They would take other people's crops, other people's provision, other people's wives. And this is what was happening right here because there was no walls, there was no gates, there was no protection. And so the raiders, they would come in and they would take everything and leave them just enough so they could exist one more season to plant crops so they could steal next year's harvest. This is the mindset that these people have been living in, institutionalized for three generations. And in Nehemiah chapter one, verse three, we're gonna just read verse three. They told him this to, me, to Nehemiah. The remnant, the people that are left in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. Now trouble here in the Hebrew mean, means that they were mentally captive. They were institutionalized generationally now because they'd been in it so long they knew n nothing else. That's all they've known. This is kind of like somebody that's being in prison and suddenly you open the gates and say you can leave and they go, no. No, I don't want to leave prison. I'm comfortable in prison. I'm happy with prison. I'm happy with my pain. I'm happy with my discomfort because I'm more scared about the unknown than the known. So, so they were institutionalized. They were held captive mentally. And also the shame. Now the shame meant that they were unpleasant to the eyes. But let me give you a picture of this. These people were worn down. They were broken down. They were emaciated. They were starved. The best picture that I could give you, maybe not quite as bad, but if you would go back to the, to, to the documentaries of the internment camps and the concentration camps in World War II of Nazi Germany, and when those people were, were freed, they, they, they were held captive, and the Jews, when they were freed, they, they were starved, and they were sunken in, and just skin and bones, and they were broken emotionally and mentally. And that's what it was like. See, the broken down walls, though, were a reflection of a broken down people. You see a broken down house, it's the result of broken down family. It's just a, a result. It's a reflection of what's going on, in the, on the inside. And in Nehemiah 1.4, it says, as soon as he heard these words, he sat down and he wept and he mourned for days. He wept and he mourned for days. Look, Weeping means some of you, <laughs> some of you never weep over your condition because it's the only condition that you know. Other people on the outside see your condition and they weep for you, but you're fine because it's normal. Strife is normal. Hate is normal. The pain is normal. The arguing, the abuse is normal. Yet other people could look at your situation and they would weep for you, but you can't weep because that's all you've known. The walls were broken down. See, if you go to a third or fourth world country, even like Nepal, before you build your home, you build a fence, you build a wall. Why do you build a wall? Because you bring all your construction materials to bring the house, and if you don't have a wall, everybody will steal your construction materials then there won't be a house. Sounds like America. Maybe America needs a wall. Maybe America should protect its provisions and what we are set to do to be the country that God has called us to be. 
See, people are telling us we don't need a wall, but walls are protection. I don't know if you know this, but heaven is a gated community with strict immigration. Hell has open borders. This is not a joke. The devil is the God of this world, little g, and he is trying to help us understand his domain and his mindset. No walls, no joy, no joy, no protection. Can you imagine just leaving your door open and your cars unlocked with your windows down and you go home and you, you, you just unlock everything, roll the windows down and everything and go to bed? You're gonna have joy? I'm just so happy I can sleep tonight. Ah, thank you, Posture Pedic. Thank you, sleep number bed. If you're not careful, your bed will be gone before you woke up. Wake up. You may not even wake up. The Bible says the gates were burned with fire. Gates represent control. Gates determine who goes out and who comes in. The gates of the city was also determining commerce, exchange of goods and values and services. And it was also where legal matters were discussed and handled. And yet, when you burn down the gates, you lose all control. Some of you, your, your gates have been burned down. Right now, you're sitting here and you have more month than money. Maybe you're facing bankruptcy, custody battles, physical sickness. Maybe your past, something happened in your past and it's holding back your future and you're sitting there held captive, out of control. If you control the gates, you control the city. If you burn the gates, you destroy the city. And maybe some of your gates have been burned, but I want, I want you to know this work, works both ways. It's not just your gates and your walls that need to be protected, but Jesus already took care of the gates of hell. The Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Why? Because he already removed them. He took care of them. We've defeated them already through the blood of Jesus Christ. But you need to get a perspective. You need to get a vision. You need to get an understanding of what God has provided for you. He's provided victory, not defeat. Life, not death. You have a people institutionalized for three generations. That's a long time. A hundred years. People have been stepping over their defeat. Now, now understand, when they destroyed the walls... They didn't haul off the rocks, the stones that made the walls. The rubble was there. The building material was there. Their answer was under their feet, but they just kept stepping over it over and over for generations. And I want to ask, what have you been stepping over in your life? What have you been avoiding in your life that maybe your grandpa avoided? Maybe your, your, your dad avoided? Maybe you're avoiding today. What kind of addiction? What kind of challenge? What kind of strife? Well, you know, cancer runs in our family. It's just the way it is. Really, why don't you step over, quit stepping over it. Deal with it. Confront it with the name of Jesus Christ. I was sharing a story yesterday in my high school. One of my friends, his granddad, he decided to tear the walls down of the family so he couldn't handle life and he walked into his bedroom and took the shotgun and blew his brains out. So my friend's dad walked in and saw it, saw the aftermath. So then his dad figured out, well, that's what you do. When life gets hard, you just blow your brains out. So what did he do? He blew his brains out. So then my friend, 17 years old, he was a businessman, entrepreneur, doing well, 17. Seemed to be all together, doing well. My friend, his girlfriend broke up with him, his long-term girlfriend. You know what he did? He went in his garage, shut the door, started the car, and sat in there and killed himself. What generational parasite is eating away at your family? And what are you ignoring? What do you just keep stepping over? What do you keep buying? What do you keep bringing in the house to say, well, this is just the way it is. This is who we are. This is how we're doing. 
See, every stone that you step over is a reminder of your defeat, but every stone that you pick up and rebuild that wall is a, is a weapon to destroy the enemy in your life. Yeah. See, fixing the wall wasn't a money problem. Fixing the wall it wasn't, wasn't even a labor problem. It wasn't a supply problem because all of the material was laying on the ground. They'd been stepping over it for 100 years. It was a vision problem. They had bad eyesight. But see, when you start focusing on God's promise for your life, and that's what Nehemiah did. He saw what God saw, and he walked in there with joy. He could do something that nobody else could do. This is why Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, people get cast off restraint. These people had no vision, so they're like, what's the use? Why pick up a stone? What does it matter? It's just one stone. How's that gonna make a difference? What's the use of putting in the time, trying to fix my family? What's the use of trying to, trying to get back to work? What's the use? And it comes from not having a vision of what God has for you. I'm sick and tired of what the society is trying to do to our younger generations. Poisoning their minds. Instead of trying to make things easier for them, maybe we should figure out how to make them stronger. Get this, the walls laid in ruins for 100 years, 100 years. Nehemiah comes along, casts vision with the joy of the Lord, which is the strength to do something that nobody else could do, and they rebuilt the walls that had been laying in ruins for 100 years. They rebuilt them in 52 days. 52 days. 52 days. They changed their life in 52 days after three generations of enslavement. What does that mean? Look, I, I did the math. They could have rebuilt the wall in that 100 years 701 times. 701 times they could have got victory back in their life. They could have had the joy of the Lord in their life. But oh no, nobody had vision. Nobody had the eyesight. Nobody saw that it was possible. You know, today, your generational spiritual tree can fork. You can quit being inbred with the spiritual demons that is destroying your life, and you say, I'm choosing a new life, a new branch, a new victory, a new hope. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. The Bible says the days of the righteous get better and better, brighter and brighter. So I'm telling you, if things aren't getting brighter over time, you're missing something. Hebrews 12, 2 says we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. What are you gonna focus on? The world? CNN? Boy, that'll fix you. They're, they just can't wait to put another death clock up. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. How did Jesus do it? How did he go to the cross? How did he bear the, the weight of the sins of all humanity? How did he bear the fact that God turned his back on him and rejected him? How did he go to hell and, and, and experience the torment that you and I don't have to, have to deal with? How did he do that? And it says, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and now he's seated in the right place of honor at the right hand of God's throne. How did he do it? Joy. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. See, joy is an insulator. What, other, what, what shocks other people? You're good to go. Right? Other people are like, Arr! you're like, I don't feel a thing. <laughs> joy is a stabilizer. It's a ballast. It's, it's a Holy Ghost gyroscope. What, what do I say by that? So let me give an, ex an example. Here's a boat that had a gyroscope installed in the hull of it. And here these guys are, are, are moving it as hard as they can, and all of a sudden they turn on the gyroscope, and what's happening? It stabilizes. See, this is some of you right now in your life. You walked in here, and you're wobbling all over the place, but if you can walk out of here with the joy of the Lord that stabilizes you, and you got the world pulling on you, you got your in-laws pulling on you, you got the business pulling on you, you got a lawsuit pulling on you, you got all this garbage pulling on you, and guess what? You're just stable. 
because the joy of the Lord is my strength. See, the joy of the Lord counteracts your normal emotional response. Look, if you have emotional responses that you don't like, the only way you're gonna get rid of them is through the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we know? It says the Holy Spirit produces this fruit in us. So if you just surrender yourself and get in the word of God, now that's, that's, a, that's a broad stroke, right? Get in the word of God. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, if you're a baby in Christ, you're, you're gonna drown, some of you. You're gonna start reading the genealogies of Christ and say, how is this helping me live? <laughs> Fact? What's the day today? It's the seventh. So Proverbs has how many chapters in it? 31, that means the book of Proverbs, that, like drop it in the middle and turn left you'll get to Proverbs. There's 31 chapters. In other words, this book of Proverbs is divided in 31 sections. That's all it is. And so what you do is you go to the day, it's, today's the seventh, and then you read the seventh section or the seventh chapter of Proverbs. Start with that. When you get the Proverbs, the wisdom of God in you, things will begin to germinate. Things will begin to start to work. Don't expect it overnight. I don't expect it overnight, but you do it day by day. Look, if you go to the gym one time, you're going to change? No, you're just going to come back going, I'm so sore. <laughs> right? Go to the gym twice. Is it going to change it? No, you're just going, I'm still so sore. <laughs> Can't even brush your teeth, put on deodorant. <laughs> Honey. <laughs> You go to the gym a hundred times and apply yourself, what, what's gonna happen? You're gonna see a change. Be in the word continually. That's what makes changes. Stay in the word and it changes you. Stay in the word and it changes you. Stay in the word and it changes you. Why? Because it counteracts your normal emotional response. So, oh, somebody's upset. Joy in the name of Jesus. <laughs> So here's the deal. Nehemiah 8.10, they'd already rebuilt the walls. He sits down with all the people, Nehemiah does, and he says, don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. They've rebuilt the wall. Now they're sad again. They did something in 52 days that three generations couldn't do in 100 years. They're done. They finished the wall. They're sitting there and they're going... What did he say? He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength, not the joy of the wall. The wall isn't your strength. The border isn't your strength. Your house isn't your strength. Your car isn't your strength. Your job isn't your strength. The joy of your Lord is your strength. And too many times people put joy into things, into hobbies. Doesn't mean we can't have fun. Doesn't mean we can't enjoy things, but your joy cannot be rooted in those things because they're temporal. In other words, you're just going to be chasing the next high, chasing the next high. Joy isn't a high. Joy is a stabilizer. It keeps you steady. It keeps you even. So you might be here today dejected and sad. And it's this simple. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you're here today and you're hurting, I'm talking about your joy has been misplaced. Maybe you didn't even know joy existed. Maybe you didn't even know you should be weeping about your situation because life could be different. Life could get brighter and brighter, better and better. I wanna pray for you today. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If that's you today and you've been hurting, you feel like you've been hopeless, you feel like you've been challenged in every way and yet, you have no idea life could get brighter, but today you say, I'm gonna put my joy in the Lord. If that's you today, will you raise your hand? I wanna pray for you today. Yes, oh yes, yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, all over this place. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you can do in one prayer that what we can't do mentally and emotionally. What we've tried to do in 100 years and in generations, Lord, you can fix in a moment because we surrender to you. 
So Lord, today we yield to you and we put our joy in you. We take our focus of joy off of these temporal things and we put our eyes on you. We fix our eyes to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. And when we have faith, we have joy because we have an expectation, we have hope. We have a reason to get up. We have a reason to be excited. We have a reason to to do the work of the Lord and be diligent because of your plans in our life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now look at me just a second. If you're here today and you're not born again, you're not serving Christ. Look, going to church is great, but that doesn't save you. Maybe your parents sprinkled you as a baby. And while that was something sentimental for mom and dad, there's no biblical precedent for that. It doesn't save you. See, you have to come to an age of knowing yes and no, right and wrong. And when you come to that age of accountability, we believe that's like the age of 12. That's when Jesus said, I need to be about my father's business. Now you're accountable for your decisions. And the Bible says that no one is righteous, no, not one. So that means you can't earn your way into heaven. You can't have a certificate and say, no, I went through these classes. Look, I'm good to go. Because it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus died for you and I. So today, if you want to surrender to Jesus Christ for the first time, or maybe you want to renew your relationship with Christ, this is your opportunity. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three, clap my hand. You raise your hand. And then we're all going to pray a prayer together. It's a simple prayer, but I I want you to own the words. We're going to pray with those that are watching online. But today, if you choose Jesus, doesn't mean you're perfect. It means that you're, you're accepting the one that is perfect. And he'll begin to grow you. He'll begin to change you. He'll give you a joy. Why? Because it's a supernatural work that man cannot do. That's why this man, Nicodemus, in the Bible came up to Jesus. He says, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, you have to be born again. Nicodemus, you know, he's being a a rational person. He goes, I can't go back into my mother's womb. What are you talking about? He was so logical. (laughs) Jesus said, you've already been born of the flesh. Now you need to be born of the Spirit. This is why Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us, when you confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart, that Jesus is your Lord, you will be saved. And, you know, religious people, that's too easy. Thank God. Thank God he just made it easy. Otherwise, I'd be going to hell. I'm serious. I'm not that good. I need easy. Are you ready? So bow your heads, close your eyes. If that's you today and you're ready to surrender to Christ, I'm gonna count to three. You raise your hand, and then we're gonna celebrate and pray this prayer. Here it is. One, two, get ready. Three, lift it up if that's you today. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Over here, down here, anyone else? Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Yes, anyone else? Yes, I see that hand. I believe there's two more here. You're ready to surrender. Your heart is beating out of your chest right now. The Spirit of God is knocking on your heart's door. Yes, I see that. Yes, I see that hand. Come on, let's celebrate that today. Let's pray this together. Make these words your own. Let's really take this moment very serious. Here it is. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Today I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Live in me as I live for you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Come on, one more time.